whispers of the word and not hearers only. Amen? You're children of faith and children of love, and both faith and love work. Faith and love are doing something, and they, they can and they will change the world in which we live. And I want to talk about that a little bit today. Um, I'm going to go back to the mass thing for just a second. So now I've done a little intro into my message, but I just want to let you know something. Uh, I've had a change of heart myself. Jonathan, I thank you for sharing. I guess he went to the restroom or something. Anyway, uh, he's not in the room. I thank you for sharing that. I didn't know what he was going to say. He just texted me a little bit ago and said, hey, I have a message I'd like to share about how the Lord changed my heart concerning the mask thing. Anyway, but I was in a conversation uh, with another minister the other day. Uh, let me back up. I was in a conversation in our prayer meeting a couple weeks ago. And I said, you know, man, the problem is when I put the mask on, my thoughts end up being based on the, the virus. It makes me think of my susceptibility or the fact that I might give it to somebody else. And I, I want to refuse those. I want to reject those thoughts. Well, I was talking with, uh, it was actually Steve Strader the other day. And, and he said, well, wait a second. What indicates the lack of faith? Putting the mask on or thinking that you become susceptible because you put a mask on? And I thought, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You just helped me. It's, it's all a matter of, of what you think. It's how you think about it. So anyway, I, I'm in, I'm in no, no additional aspect of, of fear or, any, or no less fear because I've put a mask on. I don't have any fear of contracting it from you any more than I have any fear of, of giving it to you. Um, and, and I remind you, as I've said many times over, uh, we have it written on the little pieces of, of paper, and I've sent it out. And if you don't read my messages that I send out to you, I can't help you anyway. So anyway, but uh, it, it dies. If it comes in contact with you, it, it, it dies. It dies under the mighty name of Jesus, under the hand of the Lord. So you're not a carrier of sickness and disease and just exempt from its symptoms. No, you're a killer of sickness and disease. Amen. You're a killer of it. A killer of it. So sickness and disease dies in your, in your presence. Now, I know that we don't always achieve that level. We don't always achieve that goal, if you will. But, but should you take that away as, as being your understanding of your divine authority? No, you should not. That should remain your understanding of divine authority. You say, well, I've failed more than I have succeeded. Doesn't change the word. Let God be true and every man a liar, including myself. If I fail in, in executing God's will, it is not God's will that was faulty. It was me. So I will stay in strong belief of the will of God until I rise to the level of his word. Amen? Yeah. Amen? So that's how you have to be. So uh, again, just one more time, putting on the mask, I, I realized, wow, I was letting my own thoughts go the wrong direction. I'm not wearing a mask because if, when I wear a mask, I, I start thinking about the virus or whatever. Now I've just chosen, you know, I'm going to wear the mask and think about something else. I get to choose anything else I want to think about. Whatsoever is lovely, honest, just, pure. If it be any virtue, if it be any praise, think on these things. Except for when you're wearing a mask because then it forces you to think on other things. No, no, that's not there. And so anyway, so praise God for the freedom that comes in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. What, what's the best pocket to put this thing in? Anybody know? Here we go, back here. No, because if I take the coat off, then I won't have it with me. And then I've left my coat here many times over back pocket. There we go. Had to unbutton the button and stick it in there. I got a little more bump back there now anyway, so... <laughs> Um, all right, I want to get into something with you this morning. And um, my, in, my intention is not to make you happy. My intention is not to make you sad. My intention is not to make you mad or any other emotion. My intention is to make you act. My intention is, is, to, is to help you to get your thoughts and your attitudes on who and what it is that God wants you to be and do. Because I've said several times over the last few weeks, we're in, a, we're in a, a window and a door of opportunity. Windows we look through, doors you pass through. Both are open to us right now. Both are, so this is not just a time to see vision. This is also a, a, a time to act upon what you see. Can you say amen? amen? All right. This is a time to both see and to do. All right. 
This is a time both to see and to do. Say that with me. This is a time both to see and to do. All right. Um, so if it makes you happy, fine. Some of you will, will agree with my statements for a period of time, and then you'll think that, you know, anyway, I don't care. Um, how many of you would understand that the pulpits of America, the pulpits of the world, the pulpits of the church of Jesus Christ should speak truth whether people like it or not? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, if I'm going to do that, then I have to do it whether you like it or not. So if we're going to say the, the pulpits of America have, have decided, the pulpits of the world even, have, have decided to withhold certain messages because dollars walk out the door, oh well. I've told y'all many times over the giving that happens in this church. Our church does not prosper or succeed financially because of your giving. You are not the source of supply for this church. You might be a resource that God chooses to use. But he's got unlimited source. He is the unlimited source. He's got unlimited resources. He will use somebody else. So the question is, do you want to be used and do you want to be connected to what God does here? That's the real question. God will supply what we need apart from you or through you. doesn't matter. So I'm not afraid of dollars walking out the door because as fast as dollars walk out the door, dollars can walk in the door. Okay. So again, you can, you can like what I have to say to you or not. Uh, but at least do this. Have an open enough heart to let God speak to you. Okay? So take the words that I say, argue about them, wrestle with them, talk it over with God, look it up, hear from Him, and then you decide. Okay? All right. Now, I'll probably get you good and everybody in agreement on this, on this first one, but here we go. America's under attack. Yes. America's under attack. We absolutely are. I'm going to do a lot of reading. Uh, for, uh, let me back up here. Um, I'm going to do a lot of reading of my own stuff that I've written. Um, I, I, I sat down, and it's, I, I felt like, so to speak, one of the writers of the Constitution or the Declaration of in Independence or the Bill of Rights, you know, that type of language was just kind of coming out of me. And it's like, man, it's a little bit English sounding and, and whatever. And, and so I was like, wow, this is cool. And it just kind of kept flowing. So I, I just, just kind of went with it. So I'm going to do some reading of what I wrote. And I, uh, I intend to, uh, to more fully write these thoughts and, and, um, and get them out there. Um, I don't know, they won't be necessarily officially published unless somebody helps me do that. But uh, nonetheless, here, here, America's under attack. It is. It's under attack. It's evident. You're going to have to think real sharp today. It's evident by the removal of liberties by our governing authorities as well as the refusal of liberality by mankind. I'll have to repeat a lot of statements over and over again because that language is hard to catch the first time. America's under attack. It's evident by the removal of liberties by governing authorities as well as the refusal of liberality by mankind. Now, by liberality, I mean the kindness and the showing of love and generosity that the Apostle Paul spoke about concerning the Macedonians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 2 says, How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy... And their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. See, we're, we're so politically minded, we hear the words such as liberality, and we think Republican, Democrat. We think Democrat, liberal. Because that's what the world has, has begun to call it, right? Liberal mindedness. But when the scripture thinks of liberal mindedness, it, it talks about, speaks of generosity. 2 Corinthians 8, 2, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. This is a beautiful parallel to the image portrayed of the settlers of America and the founders of our great nation, the United States of America. What do I mean? It's that liberal heart that prospered the United States such as the scriptures declare in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24, 25, and 26. Proverbs 11, 24 says, There is that that scatters and yet increases, 
And there is that, with, that withholds more than what is meat, or more than what is needed, more than what is necessary. But that tends unto poverty. Verse 25. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that waters shall be watered also himself. Verse 26. He that withholds corn, the people shall curse him, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that sells it. Now, Notice that it says that sells it, not that gives it. It's never expected by God for you to work hard and earn and gain something and then for it to all have to be given away or for it to all have to be taken away. Entrepreneurship is at the very heart of the concepts of godliness. It's at the very heart and the concepts of creativity. Creativity connects directly with the Creator who gives unto men wisdom liberally. Causes men to think wisely so that they can obtain and have what is needed. The book of James is very clear about that. But we have to also keep the balance and understand that capitalism taken too far, becomes greed. So it's not that just that God is a capitalist. No, he's an entrepreneurialist. There is a sense of capitalist, especially when you understand that from the beginning of creation, God said to man, take dominion. Capitalize on everything that I have given you. But when you take the whole of Scripture, you understand God is not saying be greedy. He's saying take everything that I have given you, make the best of it, and cause it to flourish and prosper. That's why he says replenish the earth or fill the earth. And you can look at that naturally and understand that, and you can look at that spiritually and understand that, and understanding that it is our job as the saints of God to fill the earth with His glory. We understand that His glory is more than spiritual. It has physical connection as well. And so to fill the earth with His glory means to take everything that He gives us in the Spirit and put it to work in the natural Take dominion of the, take the power and authority given us by the Spirit, and take dominion in the earth and cause things to prosper and to flourish. Amen. It's at the very heart of God. The generous soul and the entrepreneurial spirit, given liberty by our Constitution here in America, has caused this nature to, nation to prosper. I'll read it again. The generous soul, the liberal soul, the generous soul and the entrepreneurial spirit, the spirit that says, I see opportunity, I'm going to go after it, versus I see opportunity, give it to me. The generous soul and the entrepreneurial spirit, given liberty by our Constitution, has caused this nation to prosper. However, as generations have not known the suffering of poverty, they have not taught the principles of biblical morality and liberal generosity, and thus have aimed their course to disintegration, poverty, and ruin. I read that whole paragraph again. However, as generations have not known the suffering of poverty, they have not taught the principles of biblical morality and liberal generosity. And thus have aimed their course to disintegration, poverty, and ruin. That's what we're in the process of right now as an American culture. The church has fallen prey to to an ideology of self-service. Now I'm going to get close to home. We've fallen prey to an ideology of self-service rather than self-sacrifice. We have sought to enrich our own lives rather than to enrich the lives of others. Hear me. Because we abhor the evil practice of the world, we have hoarded unto ourselves the blessing of righteous living. Let me put put that out there to you again. 
because we, have, because we abhor the evil practices of the world, we have hoarded unto ourselves the blessing of righteous living, but we've done so to our own demise. We've done so to our own demise. Mark 8, 36. This is Jesus speaking. He says, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Do you agree? Yeah. Doesn't matter whether you agree or not. That's Jesus said it. It's truth. <laughs> it matters to you and to your well-being whether you agree, but it's truth. It's truth. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? But I want to ask you, and my statement is not in contradiction to Scripture. What soul does a man have if he gain Christ but not love the world in whom Christ died? Of whom, of, of whom Christ died for? Let me say it again. What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? But I want to ask you, what soul does a man have if he gain Christ but not love the world for whom he died? He's not gained Christ at all in actuality. And he has no living soul. He might be a living soul in the sense of an eternal being. But his soul has never found life. His soul functions in death. He who has not found Christ. And the evidence of finding Christ is loving others. Jesus was asked, in efforts to trip him up, what is the greatest commandment? And he said, well, this is, this, is, this is what he said. If you can boil it down, he said, there's not a greatest. There are two that together become greatest. There's not one that is greater. There is two that become greatest. Love God, love people. I want you to see a couple things about that. It was designed and ordained by God to do this thing with people. If it were just about loving God, then mission, the mission could be accomplished with one person. But when it came about loving people, it took one man to accomplish the first, but it takes all of us to accomplish the second. One man, Jesus Christ, accomplished the first. He loved God with everything. Sinless, spotless, pure. You and I couldn't do it. But he did. Jesus did. And then he gave us himself. He gave us his own spirit so that we could live according to that spirit and thus love people. Two commandments together, making the greatest love God, love people. Matthew chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, why don't you turn there? Matthew chapter 20. I like breaking the rules of, of, of preaching, especially when it comes to reading more scripture than what the, what the preaching rules uh, dictate. You okay with that? Yes. Matthew chapter 20, in the, in the beginning, Jesus is speaking. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder. And when he went out early into the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard, and when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, a day's wage, uh, he sent them into his vineyard. Now, I know a moment ago I'm talking about the generous liberal soul shall be made fat, you know, the generosity. And then you read something like this and you think, my goodness, he's going to make them work for a penny? Well, if you could imagine a penny putting food on your table for several days, uh, not a problem. So don't think about a penny by today's standard. Think about a penny as, as a standard way back then, a couple thousand years ago or so, right? Yep. So uh, verse 3, he went out at about the third hour. Of the day, and he saw others that were standing idly by in the marketplace. Do you see, do you hear entrepreneurial spirit happening here? You hear capitalist spirit with generosity happening here. And he went out about the third hour of the day, saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, "Go you also. You need a job." That's what he's saying. You need a job. First of all, in order to employ people, you have to have a business. So if you're going to hire laborers to go into a vineyard, you got to have a vineyard. And then you got to have money to pay the laborers. Otherwise, they will string you up at the end of the day. You worked me for nothing. You lied to me. I'm going to take it out of your hide. Okay. 
He said unto them, Go also into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Verse 5, He went out about noontime, the sixth hour, and then the ninth hour, and did likewise. And the eleventh hour, did likewise. Verse 7, they, they said unto him, Because no man has hired us, we're standing here. And he said to them, Go into the vineyard. They're looking for opportunity, but nobody gave it to them. So here this entrepreneurial, generous soul is saying, well, I could get the vineyard done with fewer people. They can work harder and, and get the job done, but I'm going to employ more people. Go on into the vineyard and work. Verse 8, so when the evening was come, the Lord of the vineyard said unto his steward, call the laborers and give to them their hire. Give them what we owe them. And beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came to that which was hired on the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. And when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more. And they likewise only received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house. I want you to notice something. Jesus, the scriptures, call the man a good man. Call the man a good man. Jesus did not say evil man. He said good man. When they had received their wage, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have only worked but an hour, and you gave to them that which is equal, and we've worked all day, even through the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I don't do you any wrong. Didn't you agree with me to work for a penny? So why don't you take what belongs to you, and go on your way. And I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with that which is mine? Is thine eye evil? Because is, is thine eye, notice this is, is not, not mine eye, is your eye evil because I am good? In other words, because I have been generous to these others, you're considering me evil? The real evil that's taking place is the one who's jealous of somebody else gaining more. Verse 16. So, let the la uh, so the last shall be first, and the first shall be last, for many be called, but few are chosen. Remember the beginning of this. Jesus said... This is, a, like, this is a story about the kingdom of heaven. So we can take other principles from it as far as entrepreneurship, generosity, working for proper labor, uh, not complaining, not being jealous. We can take all of those principles of it. But Jesus said in the beginning, I'm telling you a story about the kingdom of heaven. So don't miss that. So the real understanding is there will be those, there will be people like me, who according to my own words have served the Lord all the days of my life. Now we know that's not true. I was born a few days and didn't serve the Lord. But when I was three days old, I gave my life to Jesus and I've lived for Jesus ever since. <laughs> no, we know that's not true, right? But there are people who have lived for the Lord for a really long time. And then you have other people who will live for the Lord a very short time. And if they both make heaven... Why would I complain, I spent 50 years on the earth serving Jesus and you only spent five hours on the earth serving Jesus and you made heaven? I worked real hard to get here. <laughs> ah, thus revealing the evil of my own heart. Yes. Yes. Amen. Verse 17, and here's where we connect back uh, to, to my, my points concerning my main, main statements in America and the American church. The church at large in reality. Verse 17, Jesus went up to Jerusalem and he took 12 disciples apart in the way and he said to them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man, which is himself, shall be betrayed under the chief priests and under the scribes and they shall condemn him to death and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to be mocked and scourged and to be crucified of them. And the third day I will rise again. And then came to him the mother of the Zebedee children with their sons, and they worshiped him and desired a certain thing of him. <laughs> I like Jesus' response here. I can just imagine. He's telling this story. They're walking on their way. Here, Miss Zebedee and her sons come and they fall at his feet. Jesus, you're so wonderful. Oh, Lord, you're great and mighty and powerful. 
Everything belongs to you. Everything, everything. He's like, what do you want? That's what he says. What wilt thou in the King James? What do you want? Verse 21, he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, grant that my two sons may sit on your right hand. One on the right hand and one on the left hand when you come into your kingdom. Verse 22. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and be baptized of the baptism that I am baptized with? In other words, are you able to suffer what I'm about to suffer, what I have suffered and about to suffer? What has covered my life? What I have immersed myself into? Are you willing to be filled with it and to immerse yourself in it? Drink of the cup and be baptized with. To be filled with and to be immersed in. Are you willing to do that? Are you able to do that? Is really what he says. Are you able? And then he says to them, yeah, 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 I think you're able. You can do that. But in verse 23, he said to them, you shall indeed drink of my cup. And be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. Now, recognize that's talking about the persecution even unto death. But to sit at my right hand and on my left hand, that's not mine to give. But it shall be given to them from whom it is prepared of my, by my Father. You can't give what does not belong to you. And what belongs in the hands of the Father... He will, re he will retain in his hands. Don't ask the Father. Jesus didn't do it. Don't ask the Father to give you something that is not right for you to have. Let him hang on to what needs to be held on to in his hands and his hands alone. So they said, let us sit in these. This is what they're really asking. Let, let us sit in these places of divine glory and authority. Verse 24. And when the others heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brethren. 25. But Jesus called unto him, called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, we could say over each other. And they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be that way amongst you. But whosoever shall be great amongst you, let him be your servant. Let him be your minister. And whosoever will be a chief among you, let him be your servant. That word there really is better translated slave. We don't like that term in today's society. And the reason why we don't like that term is because... It was abused and misused and misappropriated and a lot of evil took place. And that type of evil took place for thousands of years. I thank God for a country that although we have it's our, our problems in the, in the area of prejudice, we do not have slavery in the same way that we did have it. But we have all been hoodwinked and become slaves to a system. Not according to race. Verse 27, I'll read it again. Whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your slave. That'll come out again a little differently. You'll have good understanding. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister, and to give his life as a ransom for many. When I said to you earlier that the church has fallen prey to an ideology of self-service rather than self-sacrifice, this is the type of occasion right here in Scripture where Jesus was saying, don't let that type of attitude, don't let that ideology become you. Be people that serve one another, but move beyond servitude and literally allow yourself to become a slave to the ones you love. I said earlier, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? But what kind of soul does a man have if he gains Christ but yet not love the world in whom Christ gave his life for? If you and I are not willing to give our life for the world, then we're not like Christ. 
In essence, it seems that our worship is all about, Jesus, you're great and wonderful. What do you want? Smile at me. I can tell by your eyes. You look Asian when you smile with a mask on. <laughs> no. All right. Can I move on to slightly different? Ready? The justification. Again, I, I don't know why this kind of language is rolling out of me, but I, here it is. I'm just reading what I wrote. The justification of socialist governance is the ideology that man cannot properly govern themselves within society and therefore must be governed by society itself. In other words, what society would not do on their own authority becomes mandated by the exercise of authority. What society would not do by its own authority would be mandated by the exercise of authority. The freedom found only in Christ is to be expressed in the sacrifice found only in man. How many of you read my Facebook post this morning? I put this out there according to this post. So I understand you may not catch this phrase. You can go out and catch it on Facebook. The freedom found only in Christ is to be expressed in the sacrifice found only in man. Who did Christ die to give freedom to? Man. Who are the only ones that can express the freedom that is found in Christ? Man, to surrender myself to the rule of mine own conscience under God's divine control is the liberty in which I die and live free. Amen. To be a slave to the message of liberty is the evidence of a free man. To be a slave to the message of liberty is the evidence of a free man. I sound like a constitutionalist. I wish I could have joined the ranks of John Hancock, Samuel Adams, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and all the others that signed. And you know why John Hancock's signature is so big on that thing, right? For a couple of reasons. One, if you know your history accurately, you find out that that first original signing, there were only two people that signed it the first day. It took 30 days to get the rest of the signatures. But John Hancock was one of the first two. There was plenty of room on the page, and he was going to take up the space. <laughs> Let it be known. I am not ashamed. I am proud of this, of what's going on. This will help to take the divine authority given by God to man and give men liberty to exercise what God has given them. Without those documents, men and women become as bound as they had been for century upon century upon century. But then some people come along and their fight for freedom sacrificed everything. People left lands. People left homes. Why? Because of tyranny and said, we're going somewhere else to establish a new land and to do something new and afresh according to, as it's written in the scriptures, how man should govern themselves. So therefore, if government does not allow men to govern themselves, then men cannot be free, neither can they exercise their freedom in Christ properly? And thus the writing of the Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, and the Bill of Rights. It is not the possession of the pleasures of the flesh that display the riches and glory of a free man. Let me say it again. It is not the possessions of the pleasures of the flesh that display the riches and the glory of a free man, but rather the gladness of heart and his singing spirit. Yes. Yes. Paul and Silas, locked up in a prison, down in the deep, deep dungeon. You think jail or prison is bad today? Yeah, psh, we don't know nothing. Look, I mean, we're talking... Cold and wet rats and filth and mold and feces and disgusting. 
so far deep down in the earth and behind every rocky corner that the light doesn't even shine. And so I find it interesting that the scripture has to indicate the time at the midnight hour like they knew any different. They were so down deep in the earth they couldn't see daylight if they tried. But yet they sang and gave glory and praise. They prayed unto God. They had liberty and freedom in the middle of their bondage. I want you to know that almost every writer of this New Testament was a criminal by the world's standards, but they were righteous by God's standards. Almost every one of them defied their governments and the rules that were given them. And God calls them righteous and took their letters and their writings and the revelations that they had and put it in a book for the generations to come to read. Now I guarantee you that men that did that out of fleshly desire and out of the squeeze of their own fleshly comforts, many of them wrote stories, but God didn't pick them. I want to urge you, don't let the hampering of your comfort hamper your spirit. Don't let the squeezing of your flesh squeeze your character in the wrong direction. Let's look at a few more places here, please, in, in Scripture. Ah, uh, for time's sake, I'll skip a couple, but you can read 1 John 3, verse 11, all the way to the end of the chapter. You can read the whole chapter. The whole chapter is good. But I want you to see out of this, let's just pick up in, in verse 19. We'll skip some, but verse 19, 1 John 3, 19. By this we shall know that we are of a truth and reassure our hearts before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart condemns us not, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing to him. Let's back up to verse 21. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, we have confidence towards God. Some people lose their confidence towards God when they put on a mask. Because they're natural and carnal liberties have been diminished and they allow what is carnal to affect the spiritual but in reality we should allow what is spiritual to affect the carnal if your heart does not condemn you you have confidence towards God you might be angry in mind but don't let your heart be troubled maintain your confidence towards God, and you'll overcome the mask. Yes. You'll overcome imprisonment if it so be necessary. I will tell you the honest truth. I am giving this to them. I'm giving them a little grace. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly right. The reason why I'm giving them some grace is because I put my word out there three months ago. And I said, when, when they wanted churches to close and that type of thing, we said, no. No. Because it defies God's law. It defies God's law. Ain't going to do it. So we stood our ground in that, in that arena. And I used language such as, we will comply to the best of our ability so long as that it does not hinder our ability to assemble, which was God's command. Well, because those were my words... I'm sticking to them, and this doesn't prohibit our ability to assemble. It might prohibit your ability to breathe. But it doesn't pro prohibit your ability or inhibit your ability to assemble. And so thus, you are here. Yes. We'll move on. If I'm not able to surrender my own life for the cause of Christ, then I am in bondage to the fear of man and to the dictates of the flesh. What do I mean? Because now it sounds like I start going the other way. Here's what people have misunderstood. I don't fight for my carnal rights. I will fight for my American rights, but I will not give up my godly character in doing so. 
I won't become a liar and a cheat and a deceiver. I won't become angry or bitter. I'm, well, I might become angry, but I will not sin. But what the church has misunderstood many times over is they think, well, that means we just got to keep our mouth shut. No, not at all. Remember I shared with you two weeks ago about Jesus and taxes. And he says, hey, Peter. Actually, he says to the guy that, who says, hey, you guys come pay your taxes. And he, said, and he calls out their hypocrisy when he asks them. He says, do the king's kids... Pay taxes? Aren't they exempt from this? And who are you? And who are we? But nevertheless, so that we don't offend them, Peter, go fishing, bring up a coin out of a fish, and pay the tax for you and me. Sacrifice. I'll pay it, but I'm letting you know it's wrong. I'll wear it, but I'm letting you know it's wrong. What's wrong about it? Ah, now we get into something that's interesting. Because it's wrong that the government would dictate and make you. But I, I'm going to give them this in my wondering. Would they have to had men done it by their own authority? Now... Considering that governments always abuse their authority, they would have pushed something else. They would have pushed something else. And so by grace, I'm giving this. I am also giving this by love towards others. I'm going to, please don't be offended by this, if you are a, a super pro mask person for health reasons. Um, well, I lost what I was going to say, so you won't be able to get offended by it. <laughs> Paul wrote, and he said, I will abstain from meats if necessary. Oh, this is what you might be offended by. So now I'm quoting Paul. You just have to take it up with him. If you can find him, duke it out with him. Um, where Paul wrote, I will abstain from meats when I sit to eat so as to not offend the weaker brethren. So if I consider somebody weaker because they insist on wearing the mask, then I, from my greater position will subject myself to a lower. That's strength. That's confidence. That's faith. That's trust. Not being moved by man, but by being moved by the heart of God. So if Paul... Jarius, or Jarius, no, it was Jonathan. Jonathan and I were talking about this Friday on the radio. If Paul could push away a filet mignon and say, you know what, I won't eat this because so-and-so sitting at the table doesn't like the fact that it's wrapped in bacon. You know a good filet mignon is wrapped in bacon. Y'all ready for lunch? We're going to close up soon and go eat. A good filet mignon is wrapped in bacon when it's cooked so that the fats and the juices remain in the meat. And so, mmm, succulent. Mm, so good. My dad sent a text to all of us kids, to Mandy and Kelly and myself, about two months ago when their meat shortage scare was going on, right? You remember that? And he's like, hey, if there's a meat shortage, I'm going to go ahead and go get a bunch. We got a freezer. We got some room. I'm going to get a bunch of meat. Would y'all like to go in on it with me? I'll find a good deal, and we'll buy extra, and then everybody pitch in, and, and then we'll divide out appropriately and, and, and whatever. So like, sure, Dad, you know, I, I'm willing to go through all the work to figure out the best deal and da 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 So a couple days later, he texts me. He says, I found it. $22 a pound at Publix for this and da 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 It's on sale. Filet mignon. We're like, all of us are like, uh, that might be a great deal, but that ain't a deal we're taking. You know, uh, no, we're, we're, we're like, man, for three ninety five a pound, we can go to Sam's Club and get, you know, whatever. So anyway, I have not risen to the level of his prosperity yet, you know. <laughs> and, and, and I have, I have simple tastes. He and I go out to lunch often, and he wants to go to these nice fancy restaurants. And, and I'm like, Dad, let's go to the taco shack, you know. And he'll say, son, it only costs a nickel more to go first class. I said, it wasn't about going first class. I like the taco shack. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a matter of taste, not a matter of expense. But anyway, 
and then, but I find now I've, I've gotten off target a little bit, but I find myself often ordering according to the right side of the menu. You know what that is? That's the price side. Of the, I find myself doing that. Uh, and, and we often will compare things and, and we'll say stuff like, man, that's 10 of these meals is a plane ticket to Mexico for a missions trip. You know, I, I think I can give that. I mean, that's how we that's how we think in, in those those terms. You know, that's that's a dozen Bibles that we can give out. But then if you're not careful, you, you sound like Judas and say, we could have fed the poor with all that, you know, and, and Jesus is saying, I got plenty to feed the poor. Anyway. All right. I, I, uh, I de- digress. Can you come back with me? All right. I know you can. If I'm not able to surrender my own life for the cause of Christ, then I am in bondage to the fear of man and the dictates of the flesh. To be unable to die for that which I believe makes me subject to the bondage of that which I I cannot embrace. I'll read it again. To be unable to die for that which I believe makes me subject to the bondage of that which I cannot embrace. I I become a slave to an ideology that I cannot wrap my heart around. And then the whole while of serving that thing, my heart condemns me and I have lost my confidence towards God. So if I must, I will surrender out of love so that my heart does not condemn me. Jesus in the text, as I mentioned that, so I'll say it this way, it's protest with a mask on. It's go down to your city hall and make a stink, but wear the mask in the process. You know. It's when we going? I don't know when you're going. Um, but at the same time, forgetting about my rights and the things that squeeze my flesh and be mindful of my conscience and the thing that squeezes other people's flesh. I can push away the filet mignon. Love prefers, yeah. Ha, ah, all right. I'll speed it up and we'll close. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most miserable. Other translations say that we should be pitied. And B.A. Baracus from the A-team said that he only pities fools. I pity the fool. Right? You remember that? I will not be a fool because I don't desire to be pitied. I don't want to be miserable. My hope is not in this life only, but my hope is in Christ in the life to come. We'll read a few scriptures very quickly here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. The whole thing, the whole thing is very good. We won't read the whole chapter. Write this down in understanding 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is Paul writing to Timothy. And he's saying, everyone else may become corrupt, but you stay straight. You keep your heart in order. You figure out the right way to do it. You figure out how to stand up for righteousness and be righteous at the same time. You figure out how to let your rights and privileges that exist in this world be squeezed and even robbed from you, but you remain righteous before God. You figure out how to obtain and how to push the government hand back and how to to get back what they've stolen from you, but don't exchange your integrity for it. Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, this brings it to the spiritual side. And the first verse says, There is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but rather walk according to the Spirit. You don't live by the flesh. The flesh is carnal and the flesh is weak. The flesh will die. But rather through the Spirit we do mortify. If you go on in, in the chapter, we do mortify. You do kill. Through the Spirit we actually put to death the things of the flesh. So in our flesh, we're like, I don't like this. I'm going to put it to death by the Spirit of God. And the whole rest of the chapter, incredible. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. The whole chapter, incredible. But in verse 8, we're troubled on every side. I am not distressed. We sang it in the 90s. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. 
struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse for his promise will endure. That his joy is going to be my strength. And I don't like that. You know why? His joy is not going to be my strength. His joy is my strength. <laughs> so they miswrote that, but forget about that, you know. But yeah, 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 it, it presses, it presses, it squeezes, it hurts even. But I will not be distressed. I will sing and make melody in my heart to the Lord, even if you can't hear it because my mouth is covered with a mask. Even if you can't understand. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? <laughs> I can see. Uh, where'd my mask go? Who was it? Was it a George Bush? One of the George... Read my lips. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what did he say next after that? Huh? No new taxes. Was that what it is? Read my lips. No new taxes. Okay, anyway. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. Troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. We'll keep reading. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing up in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. I read it to you earlier, and this is, this, is, this is what the Lord gave me that the springboard of the rest of this comes from. The freedom found only in Christ is to be expressed in the sacrifice found only in man. The surren to surrender myself to the rule of mine own conscience under God's divine control is the liberty in which I die and live free. To be a slave to the message of liberty is the evidence of a free man. Hallelujah. We have a window of opportunity and an effectual door that is open to us. We must not just see the opportunity, but we must seize the opportunity. The world is crying out for help, for help, crying out for love, crying out for answers. They're watching and they're waiting for the sons of God, the children of the kingdom that don't have to submit to the rule, but lest we offend them, we will pay what is due. They're waiting for you and I, the sons of the king, to act like sons of the king. Yes. To be unafraid, yet to be kind and gentle. To be bold and not fearful, but not angry. Some people are loud in personality. Other people are quiet. Whoever God has made you to do, or has made you to be, do it as unto the Lord. Be loud as unto the Lord, but with your loud mouth, may your words be kind. But those of you who are quiet, with your quiet personality, may your voice still be heard. Amen? Amen. 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 I'm proud of you guys. I know for many of you, it's, one, it's a kid telling somebody older that I'm proud of you. But I am. I'm honored to be amongst your ranks, to be in the same command and troops that were in foxholes together. This is our city. This is our land. This is our time. This is our place of dominion and kingdom authority and kingdom rule. Amen? Amen. It's our responsibility. Yeah, it's our responsibility. And you can do it well. You can do it well. If you got a mask on, if you don't mind, just lower it just enough for me to see your smile. Or raise it. There you go. You look gorgeous. <laughs> Father, I thank you for the people that came out today. And I know that it's not really possible for every word that gets spoken to really be grasped, except by the Spirit of God. And so by your Spirit... Would you continue to minister to us as we leave, as we go about the rest of our day, as we sleep tonight? When we wake up in the morning, we shall know more by the Holy Ghost than what we heard in English today. Seeds that were cast out, broadcast today, 
we'll find good soil, we'll find water, we'll find light and revelation and grow bearing fruit that lasts forever in our lives. We thank you for the might and dominion, the authority that you give us in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the privilege that you give us as king's kids. The freedom that we have in Christ, freedom from sickness and freedom from the fear of it. Freedom from the bondage of man, yet freedom from pride. We humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and you shall lift us up. We thank you for it. We thank you for your divine grace at work in our life. And we receive favor from the Most High. We receive protection from the Most High. Provision from the Most High. Wisdom from the Most High. The Ancient of Days. In the name of Jesus, we thank you. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, sir. Uh, it's not on. I want to emphasize what Pastor was saying there towards the end about being kind. Don't don't go into the Publix and argue with the poor person that's at the front of the store asking you to put on your mask. That's not being kind. That's not being a, an example. You may not like it, but... When you but, say poor, you don't mean financially poor. You just mean the guy that get, got yeah. given the sorry job of having to police everybody. The, yeah, the mask. poor... The, yeah. The, so, <laughs> you know, show compassion. Show compassion. Don't... don't be careful not to have an, an attitude of rebelliousness yeah. in it. And, it's, and I'm, I'm not pro-mask either, so don't, don't think that, you know. But I'm going to be, I'm not going to put some, I'm not going to get in an argument with somebody. Be kind. Be nice. Yeah. Amen. Okay. I, I, uh, I intended to read one other thing. Can, can you give me three minutes to read something else? Um, it's really early compared to what we normally get out. I mean, like, really early? Like a half hour early, you know, in, in some measures. So, and this will be the last time, uh, maybe for a while, of some length of service. So uh, you can enjoy short next week, right? Um, so if you enjoy it at all, uh, some of you, it's going to make you miserable. I'm, I'm sorry, you'll be willing to lay down your... Okay, anyway, let me read. You've heard this poem in very short before, uh, and you will recognize the one, the, the couple lines that come out. But I'm going to read you the entire thing. Two little lines I heard one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then in that day my Lord to meet and stand before his judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in his will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. When this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true with e'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. 
Oh, let my love with fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn, living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I'll hear the call, I know I'll say, "'Twas worth it all. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee." Good day.